Welcome to the Stream of David on Om Times Radio with best-selling author, channel, and creator of the Taya Spiritual Practice. David Strickle shares the eternal wisdom of the consciousness called the Stream. The Stream of David show is fun and informative and seeks to not only answer all your spiritual and life questions, but to also provide proven tools to navigate life's obstacles and find a path to joy, clarity, and abundance by hearing the Stream's no-nonsense, direct approach to spirituality. Prepare to have your mind blown and receive clarity on your life and the universe like you perhaps never have before. And now, your host... David Strickle. Welcome to the Stream of David Show. I am here today with a guest, Vanessa Stoikov. Am I saying your last name correctly? You sure are. <laughs> Usually we do a little pre-show banter and I make sure I'm pronouncing everything correctly, but we had some technical issues. Uh, Vanessa is calling in very, very early in the morning from Sydney, Australia, very early on Tuesday morning in Sydney, Australia, still Monday afternoon here in the United States, obviously. Vanessa, I'm excited to have you on because you're a money mindset expert, and we all need to hear from a money mindset expert these days so that we stay in the proper money mindset. So how are you? Yeah, look, I'm very well, thank you, indeed. And I'm sitting here in the beautiful Blue Mountains, which is an hour and a half out of Sydney, looking looking at cliffs, feeling very peaceful, but I have to say more than ever, the pandemic and, and COVID-19 means that, you know, money's at the top of mind for most people. So, you know, having a right frame of reference around how to think about money, you know, is pretty crucial at the moment. Absolutely. And you know, my, um, the teachings that we've created around the Taya practice are based in law of attraction. And of course, inevitably, the most popular subject is always money. And we talk about health, we talk about relationships, we talk about general well-being. Very often when I channel the stream, people wanna know what life on other planets is like, and things like that, of course. But the number one topic is always money because everything that we do in our society really comes back to our ability to generate wealth and how much uh, freedom we have, how much joy we have in our lives. And I understand there's a lot of people in spiritual circles that will say things like, well, money doesn't matter. Uh, money's unimportant. You don't need money to be happy. And I'm the first one to say, Vanessa, that I had manifested a lot of money in my life. I got this law of attraction thing very early on. I just understood it before I even knew what it was called. And I was able to manifest a, a generous income for many, many years. I started at age 19 in my own business. And by the time I was in my 40s, I was a top executive in a Fortune 500 company. I always had a high salary. Money always came very easily to me. But I absolutely got to a place in life where I had a lot of money and I wasn't happy. So I talk about balancing money and happiness a lot. And I found that I've talked about that more than changing the money mindset. So I'm happy to have you back on and kind of get back to the roots of all of that and talk about limiting beliefs and how we end up with the money mindset that we have, and more importantly, some some tips to change that. So I'm just gonna let you kind of take that and go with it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Well, you know, I actually think that everyone's got a money story, and really I call myself a money storyteller, which doesn't mean I'm a fibber. It means that what I'm trying to do is connect people with the story they have in their head around money, and usually that story is, is started in childhood. So how we grew up, the beliefs our parents or our carers had, the community we grew up in, a lot of that determines what our true beliefs around money are. So even if you want to use the law of attraction and want to attract abundance, if deep down you feel like money's just hard to get or you're never going to be able to really have enough, then no matter what you do, you know, unless that deep-seated belief in you changes, and that's doing a bit of psychology on yourself and your past, then you'll never be able to get past that and money will always be a struggle. So there's kind of the practical side of how to be good with money. And a lot of people earn the big salaries and work at the companies, but we've seen even with this pandemic, they just haven't had the savings and the ability to, to do the right things with their money to give them security. And money's two things, money security and money is freedom and choices. And, you know, the, the first part of getting your head around money is creating enough security for yourself in saying, you know, I have enough and here's my plan on how I've done that. 
And here's how I overcome my childhood beliefs that there isn't enough or that I won't, I am not good enough to attract it or that I'm not educated enough or I don't come from the right family. Um, and there's a lot of limiting beliefs we have that cause a lot of pain. Um, I think on the other side of the fence, there's people that genuinely struggle because they have families and life's expensive and, you know, it's it's very hard to get by these days, particularly if you're paying for kids as well. And they don't know where to turn to talk to anyone about this. It's not like you can go to a doctor and say, give me a script around my money mindset, fix fix my problem. You know, a lot of the time we've got to do a not only soul searching, but really educate yourself and go to a number of sources. So, you know, I put together lists of other people to read, who to look at, what to understand. And I do put together lists of practical money experts who know things about how to actually manage money as much as I do around how you think about money. And it's an education process. And it's actually takes time and I think people shouldn't give up it's like a diet I keep going I'm losing five kilos and then you know a week later find myself um, eating a muffin that looks delicious and thinking oh I want the muffin now and this is taking a long time and creating wealth takes a long time for people and I think that's sometimes why they give up because they think it's not working it's not happening you know, I'll just give up and accept who what I've got and be disappointed with my life. Yeah, we tend to regress. You know, we, we work to change things and then we, we sort of get some momentum going and then it's not unusual at all for us to regress, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a tough one, money, because there's no quick answer. There is no such thing as fast money. I find that very disappointing. I tried for years to <laughs> to <laughs> figure out where that was. Um, it doesn't exist unless it's illegal, in which case that brings a whole bunch of other problems. So Typically. the growing wealth, <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> that's a whole nother show. I was going to say, unless um, you're a politician, then it seems to be okay. But I'm going way or, down or a low in, vibration in, path there. So. <laughs> <laughs> or in the Sons of Anarchy or something, you know. So, exactly, um, exactly. Um, but it does take time to master, like anything. And I tell my children, I have three sons, that, you know, it's 20 years to be a master at something when they want to give up after a year or, or a month on something they're doing. And I do think money mastery, to be a master in that takes time too. It doesn't mean you can't move towards it and it doesn't mean you can't learn skills quickly. And I also believe in the power of attraction. I mean, when I was... 19 or 20 I'd go into the BMW car lots and sit uh, in the cars I wanted and imagine they were mine and smell them and feel the wood you know under my hands because I'd sworn by 25 I would have this car now the fact that I'd sat in my country town with my parents and watched a show called sale of the century in my childhood and the winner and the smartest person got the BMW Somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd associated that if you're the best and the smartest, you drive a car like that. And obviously, you know, a day before my 25th birthday, I, I got that car and I was driving that car. But part of attracting it to me and believing in it was pretending I already had it and going to places and sitting in it and feeling like it was mine. And that was certainly a part of it. But the other part was I put it on a lease and, you know, I lost money on it. So <laughs> to be practical... Yeah. You know, yeah. it took it's one me thing a to long manifest time things to figure and, and another for money, right? Yeah, because you have to know the skills. And and so it's not just manifesting the objects. And I spent my 20s manifesting pretty much everything I wanted as far as diamonds and clothes and cars and travel and all the things I wanted. But the way I'd structured it left me in a lot of debt. So right. I say to people, you know, money is, is about as much about getting your budget sorted, which sounds boring. Budget is the worst in the world. But the first thing to money skills is understanding what your life costs every month. And most people can't tell you that. They can tell you what they earn every month, but they can't really tell you what their life costs because things go on credit cards, some bills are paid quarterly, like electricity or whatever. And so they don't actually have a clear picture of what their life costs. So there's a good percentage of us, more than half, that actually spend more than they earn every year of their life and wonder why money's such a problem and why they're always playing catch up. 
So until you know the basics, what does your life cost? How can you get those costs down? Because overheads and costs are, are dead money. You're not getting where you want to go if you're paying overheads and then start thinking, okay, now how do I create wealth? How do I become an investor? How do I start a business? How do I save for retirement? Yeah, and to your point too, you know, things and money are two two different subjects. And a lot of times we equate having a lot of nice things with looking like we have a lot of money, and perhaps we do, but that doesn't mean that you have a generous flow of money. It doesn't mean that you've got a safety net. It, you know, it doesn't mean that you're really living a life of freedom. In fact, you're very often when you're buying all of these things to to sort of make yourself happy, you're never going to get happy with things, first of all. I, I taught that to myself. I thought that, you know, growing up very poor. I thought that having a lot of nice things was was the key to happiness. And I had a beautiful home and beautiful cars and, you know, nice clothes and all of those things. And I was still not happy. And I still like those nice things. But I had to teach myself that a buying a lot of things on credit is not the same as having money. <laughs> it's in fact, it's the opposite. Correct. Of the second yeah. thing was that all of this nice stuff and even the money in the bank, because I, I did get to a point where I had you know a nice balance of no debt, lots of um, nice things and, and still money and still didn't love myself and, and had a lot of other things to deal with in my life that the money wasn't curing it. So you have to find balance in your life, but don't go so far into finding this balance that you start demonizing money. I, I see a lot of people in spiritual circles doing that, that money is evil and money is awful and you shouldn't be talking about money. And if you're really spiritual, you shouldn't be into that. And I understand that the universe always provides, but we do have a system of currency on this planet and it's very much tied to, to a flow of, of currency. No matter where you are, you're going to have more freedom in your life if you're attracting a nice, generous flow of, of money and that you... I don't believe in necessarily hoarding a lot of money, but certainly having enough so that you know that no matter what happens, you're okay. Yeah, and look, and this pandemic has just shown, unless you have six months at least worth of savings to cover your life, then you're just living in a, in a world where you're faced with constant insecurity. And, you know, we don't get taught that at schools. The schools don't focus on, hey, let's teach people to not use credit. And, you know, you can use debt to buy an investment like a house, but credit cards are just, you know, they're, they're bordering on the word evil because what they do is they keep you tracked in the cycle of paying off things you bought yesterday and never being able to get to tomorrow, being Correct. financially free. Um, so that's, that's something that's really important. But I, th I think the other thing is to recognise the sort of patterns you are. I developed a model for people to try and understand and it's on my website and you can do a, a free little quiz to say oh, i talk about unlearning money habits what are the things that are holding you back and a big one is desire so that's buying all the things and, and racking up debt um, another one is focus because a lot of people are just focused on where's my next holiday you know what's my next car you know i want that handbag whatever it is and not a focus of what do i want for my life and how can i attract money from that so I tell people to look up a lot, look up from your life and are you happy in what you're doing? Are you prepared to do this for the next 30 years? Because, you know, happiness, as you were saying, you can have all the things in the world and still not be happy. And happy is about purpose. If you know what your purpose is and you're walking towards that, you can find a way to attract money to yourself. This environment is an interesting one too, because more than ever online businesses have a real chance at success because people can't go out. Um, and I don't think we've seen the last of a world of pandemic. I, we may not ever find a cure to COVID and it's not something any of us want to hear by a long stretch. We've actually done pretty well with it here in Australia because we're a big island and we're quite isolated. So we're a long way away from anyone right. else. And the, the truth is we don't world. know what the world's going to look like. It's probably not going we to don't. go back to exactly the way that it was. And, and we've got to adapt to it and learn to be happy with the new reality, which I think is completely possible. I think it is too. And I think humans are immensely adaptable. That's kind of what we do. We're amazing creatures in that sense. But it could be a good time for people to look at their money and look at what's been holding them back and think, yeah, I'm going to change my life. The, the world has changed and so have I. And do something online or do something for themselves that will create money, you know, that takes advantage of the times we're living in. Everyone's talking about the pivot in business. What are you pivoting to? But you know, you've got to pivot in your money situation as much as you do in your life situation, particularly well, if you have it's nice right. To, 
if you want to start a business and, and want to do something on your own, because a lot of people that are employed are, are losing, have lost their jobs or losing their jobs or face the possibility of such with, with things closing down the way that they have. And, and now in Southern California, I'm hearing that my county is going to continue to be closed down until June 19th. And that's that's a whole other month of, of a lot of people being out of work. So if they had the ability to do something to start their own business, this crisis is creating immense opportunity. As you have noted, the, the world's going to move more and more online. I can tell you that I'm looking to invest in a home gym at this point because I really miss going to the gym and I don't want to have that taken away from me in the future the way that I have in the past few months. So there's a whole new you know, home gym industry that's going to pop back up and that's going to become more in vogue. So there's all sorts of things that, that you can do to change your circumstances, but a lot of times you do need to tap into the, the wealth to be able to do it. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, and I think a lot of people have got to realize perhaps, you know, for them, there's a hard road ahead to get somewhere they're happy with the money, but how can they teach their children something differently? So if you know you're someone who's lived on credit or who doesn't know what they earn per month or hasn't had a budget or hasn't had a discipline around at least saving 10% of what you earn, how can you start to your, talk to your children about that and start changing their mindset? Because impressionable minds are the easiest to teach. It's like they learn languages so easy when they're little and the older we get, the less we're able to do it. So Certainly. it's a really important time to talk to your kids about money, even if you're not where you want to be, even if your life's less than ideal and money is one of your big pressures to say, I wish I'd chosen differently. Here's the things I would have done differently. Here's what I'm doing now to change things, you know, and, and get your kids to start thinking about it and do it consciously so that they have a chance to go out with the right money mindset. That's great. And, you know, we're going to take a break, but when we get back from the break, I do want to de delve into that because that early childhood development, that's positive and negative. They learn good or bad habits. And if you've learned bad habits, you don't have to carry those forever. We're going to talk about that when we get back. Conscious Media for Conscious Minds. Ohm Times. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. It is time to celebrate self-discovery and personal growth. But you know, your efforts have to be consistent in order to stay balanced and to overcome depression and fears. So, what new books are available? How do you stay centered? Elizabeth Joyce and her guests will help you find out. That's Elizabeth Joyce on Let's Find Out. Mondays at 6 p.m. on OM Times Radio. The Thai Spiritual Practice is changing lives all over the world. Listen to what just a few of our Thai Boot Camp graduates have to say about this life-changing experience. This work is profound. If you do the Thai Boot Camp and maintain a daily practice, you will fundamentally change your life. I've maintained my practice pretty regularly since graduating. I meditate every day. I trust the universe to deliver what I want. I set intentions for my day and I monitor my vibe up and down my virtual spiral. Doing these things consistently and regularly has made me a better father to my kids, a better lover to my partner and a better boss to my team. This work is transformational and it will completely change your life. I can't recommend it enough. I'm happier than I've ever been in months, years. You know, just learning how to live life again. I'm living proof. This course is amazing. It's life changing. Visit thestreamofdavid.com slash TYA to learn more and book your free discovery meeting today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. 
If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back. I'm here with money expert, money mindset expert, Vanessa Stoikoff. We were talking before the break a little bit about changing uh, the, the early childhood patterns that we all develop. And take, we take those into adulthood very often. Of course, I teach a, a program, as you heard in the commercial, called TIA, stands for Trusting Your Abundance. And we do something in that program called detuning. And it's all about changing those mindsets. So why don't you share some of your tips uh, and techniques for changing the money mindsets that we carry into adulthood from childhood sometimes that do not serve us? Hmm. Well, I think a lot of the time it, you know, meditation every day definitely works. And whether you use an app or your method or you, <laughs> there's plenty of ways to figure out how to meditate. Now, I like apps because they keep you on track as far as tracking your progress and reminding when you forget to do it for a day. But meditating on also on what you do want. A lot of the time we spend 90% of focus on what we don't want, what we fear, what we're dreading and what we're worried about and 10% on what we'd like. And you need to switch that focus around and put 90% of the focus on what we would like. And that even means, I mean, I do journaling every day. So I sit and write, you know, not just my complaints. And there's a little bit of that still, but mainly <laughs> what I'd like to see. I love that. There's right, always a little bit of a win. <laughs> um, <laughs> you, you've got to put them out too. Um, That's true. But where I'd like to see myself go and, and you know, I've, built a business and sold it to a listed company and, and still have my main production business where I create storytelling around money. And that's what I do for a living is I create fictional stories or education to get people closer to thinking about money. But you have to focus on what you want to, to be and have a focus, not just in your meditation, not just in your journaling, but talk to it. Talk about it with your friends and family too. A lot of the time we keep the fact that we want to change secret. And if you do that, it's very hard to change, particularly if you've got a family, because they expect you to be as you've always been. And it, you know, you have to be open enough to say, look, I'm trying to change my mindset. I'm trying to teach myself different beliefs. I'd love to do that with you all, children, partner, whatever. But at the moment, I am focusing on moving towards that myself. And you need to give me the space to do that. Because I think open communication is very important in a family. And then it's about educating yourself on a practical level, you know, your mindset and your beliefs and, and moving towards what you want is a subconscious thing. But then the conscious thing is you have to have the skills. So, you know, I've put up and, and obviously I'm Australian, so a lot of the resources are Australian, but we still speak English out here. Um, things on my website where people can access, where it's a, a journal to write, you know, where would you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in 20? What are the things you wanted to do as a kid? What did you dream of being that you gave up on your dreams? And I think that's the saddest thing of all in life is when people give up on their dreams and you can kind of see it in their faces. You know, when people are just resigned to that's their life and it's not the life they thought they'd have. And, uh, you know, I, I honestly believe it's never too late. It's never too late to change your life. I mean, you can be 50 and 60 and still thinking, I want something different. Yeah, I was, I was going to I say, I... Towards that? I worked in a corporate situation and I reported to the CEO and I worked with a group of director, vice president level people, and none of us were happy. We all had a nice title. We all had big fat paychecks. None of us were happy doing what we were doing. None of us had ever dreamed. We, we didn't dream as children to do that job. We wanted something more romantic or glamorous, of course. And we, it's something that we fell into and then we started making the money and then we sort of just became a slave to the paycheck because you would go out and buy things to make yourself happy because the job didn't make you happy. <laughs> and so I wanted to soothe myself with vacations and, and cars and houses and things like that. And there was never enough to, to soothe it. So at 50, I made a big change. I left and, and started you know, what I do now. And I'm so happy that I did. And, and the, the money is not consistent the way that it was, but I've learned how to live with the inconsistency of it. And have not really changed my lifestyle, which is a, a nice part of it is that I didn't have to really do that. I still you know, live pretty much the way that I did before, but not everybody's able to do that. And not everybody 
has the wherewithal to just jump out of the airplane as I did, and especially if you have a family and things like that. I didn't have that to, you know, to, to contend with. But I still, I'm with you. I think it's really sad when people give up on their dreams and they reach middle age. And I work with a lot of people in my program too that they've hit middle age and they realize, gosh, you know, half my life has been this. I don't want the second half to be that. I want the second half to be what I want it to be. And having the, the power of wealth behind you, or at least the skills to start building in that direction can really change that. Yeah, it can. Absolutely. And I do think middle age, I mean, my book that I wrote is called The Breakfast Club for 40 somethings. And if, and if you, I'm 47 this year. If you watch John Hughes films when you're growing up, like The Breakfast Club, and it was all so cool back then, and everyone wanted to be the bad boy or date the bad boy. Turns out as you get older, you're like, that's the last guy I'd want to pick <laughs> now. You you're the that. skinny, nerdy guy that's going to start a software company, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Little did we know um, back then. I know. I know. Life was so different. But when you think about what life was like then and the dreams you had as a teenager and the culture we had in that era of the 80s, and then you get to now, and if you've got kids and I've got three, A, kids are incredibly expensive and time-consuming, and you want to do a good job with them. You know, you, you want to be a parent that's put in. But to do that, you have to give up a large part of yourself and your own dreams and what you'd like to do. So I think for a lot of people in this age group, 40s and 50s, it's about waking up to, hey, you need to put some time back into yourself and your family will be better for it. And even if you don't have a family and you're just working and working and, you know, and you think, well, this is it for me, this is my life, like you do need to invest in yourself again by spiritually investing in yourself and also skilling up. Like money is a skill and it's unfortunate that people who were born into money learn the skill by osmosis from their parents and from their families. So, you know, they know how to invest. They know how to buy a share. They know how right, to Right, that's just the way of life for the family, exactly. It is, it is. And real money is creating multiple income streams because if it's anything this pandemic has shown us, if you make money one way and you're reliant on that and something changes, then your whole world is taken from you. But real wealth is creating multiple streams of investments, like having a share portfolio or a managed fund portfolio. I think it's 401k over there, having that savings pool, you know, maybe buying something that increases in value rather than buying something that decreases in value. Right. Like a car decreases. It's not an investment. It's a nice thing to have. But if you're going to buy a fancy car, maybe buy one for half the price and put the other half in something that's going to increase in value. Everything is a choice. And if once you understand what's an asset that's going to make you money and what's not, you start to make different choices on that level as well. Well, there's a maturity there too. And, and I was one that I used to lease cars and I leased a brand new you know, German car every three years. I've had Mercedes and, and Audis and a Porsche and all these, all these cars and, and I love them. And of course, having the latest technology and all the bells and whistles is great. But when I left my corporate job to do what I'm doing now, A, I didn't drive all the time. I don't drive all the time like I used to because I work from home now. I'm not traveling. And I didn't want to have that big investment in a vehicle. I wanted to be able to put that money into my business. So I went and bought a six-year-old used Mercedes. And I love that car just as much as my $90,000 Audi that I turned in at the end of the lease that I was paying $1,200 US a month for, which was a big lease payment. And I really do like this car. I may keep it just long term. I don't know. I, I, I still love cars. I like to see the new ones and things like that. But at the same time, as a business person, I look at it as, gosh, if I'm putting $1,000 a month into the car just for a payment, that's $1,000 a month I could do something with in my business and, and, and you know, basically invest in myself instead of this depreciating asset that's sitting there gathering dust because I barely drive it. So that was something that took me a few years to learn that I used a lot of people buy a luxury car, they'll lease one for three years. And when they turn it in, it's still basically a brand new car. And when you go buy the That's used version of it, you can save 50% on that car and not lease it. And actually the money that you're putting into it every month, you're buying it. So you have an asset at least that you can sell or trade in at the end. Whereas with a lease, you're spending $1,200 a month and then you give it back when you're done paying for it, which I understand. No, that I do understand the value of leasing. Sometimes it works. But for me, it was, it was a lesson learned that, gosh, I don't have to have the newest, shiniest car. And after you've had that a few times, you realize that it's not what it's cracked up to be, that it's not going to make you happier in general. 
and it's not going to make you a better person and you become less and less concerned about what the world thinks of you, hopefully, as you get older. And I've learned all those lessons now, so I'm, I'm happy not spending that money in that way. Mm, and I think that last statement you made is right. You know, when you have nice cars, you feel like everyone thinks you must be a success. And at some point in your life, it feels good for other people to think you've been successful. But if deep down you know you don't own it anyway, I mean, you know, I've been in the situation with the fancy car and the big multi-million dollar house and real estate's expensive in Sydney. So, you know, you don't actually get much for spending one and a half million dollars in Sydney. It's a pretty ordinary house, um, which is a shame. But um, when you have all the trappings, but the pressure that comes with that, is on your back. It's not happiness. In fact, it's it's gilded bars in a cage. So that's a good you know, way to put I that for sure. All the time, the bars may be golden, but they're still bars, and you're trapped. You're still um, a slave to that that debt for sure. Yes. Yeah, slave to being a slave to money. Money's a fabulous servant, but a terrible master. And if you're a master, you know, if it's your master, because you have to earn all these things to keep your life going then you're in a position where you can't choose and you don't have the freedom, no matter how you look on the outside. And there is a fair part of the world that looks like they have it on the outside, but are entirely unhappy on the inside. So, you know, it is a matter of thinking what's important to me. I too have a Mercedes that's well, seven, six years old as well, and I own it. And I do love that car too. And my kids say, can I drive it? Because I've got one on, you know, 17 now, and I say no. And, and buy them their own <laughs> very cheap car because yeah. they've got to earn it to one day get to that too. But it's an outright thing. Don't get the lease. Don't get into debt. And it's the same with a house. If you can want the house that you can't afford to buy, don't buy it. Buy something that you can afford to live in and be happy with your lot and give yourself freedom. And it's all about the choices that you make to set yourself free. There's a, there's a guy I love who has a podcast called Mr. Money Mustache in America. And he talks about, you know, saving enough and investing enough when you're young that you can be retired in your 30s. Now, he has quite a different philosophy because he has a base of life that he wants and that's how he wants to live. And he knows his investments will pay enough for him not to be able to work again. Now, I wouldn't be happy with that level of life. I know that of myself and, you know, I know the education I want to give my children and that costs money at those schools and it's not the life I would live, but it's an absolutely great philosophy for looking at what's the minimum you could live on to be happy and give away thoughts of everything else. Just get to that point. Understand what that number is and get to that point. I mean, that's a pretty cool way of looking at life too. Absolutely. And I think that if, if you don't, I, I, there was something about feeling deprived as a child for me that made me want to spoil myself as an adult. And that led to some problems in my 20s. I got past that after that. And luckily, I started making enough, earning enough money to where it wasn't such a problem anymore. But I remember in my 20s, when I started earning money, I wanted to spend every dime because I felt I was deprived as a child. And now that I was an adult earning my own money and making more than my, my mother ever did, I wanted to have it all. So yeah. what's your advice on that? If you, if you, that. Right, right. And maybe people need to learn these lessons. I'm very stubborn. And I knew somebody took me aside in my early 20s and said, you know, pay yourself first, invest 10%, save 10%. And then whatever's left is what you live on. And that, that dictates your lifestyle. And I knew he was right, but I ignored him anyway. <laughs> Yeah, well, that sounds boring, though, doesn't it? It's like me saying how to budget. Like, yeah, I don't think like, so. Oh. Yeah, so <laughs> maybe your 20s like is the type. <laughs> yeah, I know. Now, I had someone in my 20s who was a girlfriend of mine who actually was a financial planner insist that I save 10% of money and opened up an account for me, so that went in. And I did find that worked because I didn't see the money go. It, as soon as I got paid, it, it left my bank account, and that's a pretty good way to overcome I want to spend it all and have it all if it's taken away from you the minute it hits the account. So there's little tricks you can do to curb your behavior if you're that way inclined to at least give yourself a little bit of a buffer and a head start. To, to, to yeah, I did the same mindset. thing. I, I set I set myself up to where I, the money was just taken out of my paycheck every, by, you know, every two weeks so that I never saw it in the first place. And if I didn't get my hands on it, it was okay. And then I was, I was amazing. It was amazing to me how quickly that money grew when it was invested correctly. 
and yeah, that and felt not really touch good. for you on things. Yeah, right. And <laughs> that that right. was the tempting thing is not to touch it. The only time I did touch it was to, to to buy a property. So that was a pretty good for me. That was a really good disciplinary thing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So again, it's those practical tips of what are the skills you need to have in money, and and you can meditate and be positive all you want, but if you don't have the base skill sets, then it'll still be very difficult. So. I think get your mindset right, focusing on what you do want, journal about what you do want, talk to other people, including your children about that, but also get a basic level of skills. And I was looking at, there's people like Suze Orman in America. I mean, you guys have some amazing money experts over there. We've got some good ones here in Australia too that are authors and have podcasts that just give people ideas and inspiration. Not all of it will work for you, not all of it's relevant, but unless you put a percentage of your time and I actually set a challenge to say to people, seven minutes a day, learn something about money for seven minutes every day. Subscribe to a newsletter, listen to a bit of a podcast, read an article, but seven minutes of every day, educate yourself about money. I think that's really good advice. We have uh, one more break to go to, and when we get back, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into these techniques. And... I really want to talk about the mindset part of it because I think you can you can study all you want, like you say, but unless you, you clean up your mindset, you're not going to be disciplined about it. It's got to feel right. We'll be right back with Vanessa Stoikoff. Feed your soul with waves of consciousness on Ohm Times Radio. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. The student asks the teacher, how do I experience transformation? The teacher replies, when the student is ready to receive deeper answers, the student then asks, how do I know what deeper questions to ask? And the teacher replies, when the student decides to commit to a practice inviting transformation, level two questions will be revealed. Hi, I'm Tomas Garza, and as a teacher and host, I'm inviting listeners to enroll in the Mastery of Transformation by joining me on Decide to Transform, your bridge to level two answers, Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on Ohm Times Radio. The Thai spiritual practice is changing lives all over the world. Listen to what just a few of our Thai boot camp graduates have to say about this life-changing experience. I see Taya overflowing in every aspect of my life. It's just truly magnificent. There were times that I was not self-assured and didn't have the self-confidence, but now I'm fearless. I really love myself and I know how to live in joy and let go of all these things that held me back from living this beautiful life I've always dreamed of. And it's amazing how rapidly those things start showing up once you practice Taya. It changes everything about you and it, it, it will affect all other aspects of your life, your health, your, your career, your money, your relationships. And I think that certainly has helped with my anxiety, with my mental health. I'm realizing that, wait a second, I do deserve the best in life. Visit thestreamofdavid.com slash TYA to learn more and book your free discovery meeting today. Opiates has taken everything and everyone I've ever loved away from me. Everything. I blew my ankle out and I got prescribed pain pills by my doctor. If making my detox public is going to help somebody, I'm all for it. I just wish I would have had a warning. Opioid dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth. Spread the truth. A message from Truth, the Ad Council, and ONDCP. We are back with Vanessa Stoikoff, money expert. So I wanted to dive in in this last segment about the intentionality behind manifesting money. 
how we have to set our mindset in that money vibration, if you will. I'm getting maybe a little more woo-woo than you're accustomed to going, but that's okay. Um, the, the intention is so important because I, I was always good with money. One thing I wasn't good with, though, was my weight. I lost uh, over 100 pounds at one point. I was almost 300 pounds, and I've kept it off for over 10 years. And people ask me all the time, how did you do that? What was the diet? What was the plan? And I always said it was never the plan as much as my mindset getting where I needed to be and then really allowing all of the things that I needed to, to be healthier to sort of fall into place for me and building those healthier habits based on my mindset of, of, of being a person who's in better health. Hmm. And it's, and it's about then you're not picking up the muffin or the whatever your version of the muffin is. Right, you're not falling back into the old habit. Yeah, exactly. you're not seeing it as a treat. You're seeing it as, as it taking away from your health. And that's a huge mindset shift for weight loss. Yeah, we can apply that toward money also. And I know you work a, a lot with women because in our society, and I'm sure it's the same in Australia as here, is women are not necessarily taught the same things about money as men. It's still, even though it's 2020, uh, it's, it's, it's surprisingly slanted toward men being the ones who manifest money and, and, and women being the ones who go out and shop and spend. And that's not always the best thing for their own freedom and independence. So do you want to speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think for women, one of the biggest things I do is is say it's okay <laughs> to make money because a lot of the time women feel like it's selfish to focus on m making money, particularly if they're mothers and think their focus should be on their children and their family. Um, but money creates a better experience for your children and family. So I say to women, liberate yourself from any guilt you would have or anything that money is bad, money is good. And one of the big things I ask people to do is write their own money story. To change your mindset, you need to understand where it came from. So, you know, it can start with once upon a time, a long, long time ago, whatever, let's rip off Star Wars in another galaxy. But you need to write down what your childhood was like with money. Write yourself a story, because until you write your own story, what did your parents tell you about money? What is your first memory of money? What did you think as a teenager about money? You know, you, you said that you always felt a bit deprived in your childhood, so you wanted to spend up when you made your own money. I mean, there's your money story. That, that's what you had to overcome to think, you know, I didn't have enough when I was a kid, so I was going to make sure I had more than enough as an adult. And a lot of the time we do that as parents. We give our kids so much more than we had because we want them to have more in childhood. And that's not necessarily the right thing either. So starting to write, and it doesn't have to be a, a, a Jeffrey Archer novel, I'm talking... It can be 500 words, but what's your story with money, your memory with it, your parents' attitude to it? Because you'll start to investigate where your attitudes came from. Then you can meditate on and, and think about, okay, well, I, they no longer serve me. How do I put that down in my life and say those thoughts, those beliefs, those patterns no longer serve me? I no longer want to carry them with me. So I'm putting that down because I'm going to reinvent myself. And I talk a lot about reinvention. Reinvention is about who you want to be next, not what you were. Everyone is capable of change. Absolutely. One of the things the uh, when I channel the stream, one of the things that that, that message uh, shares is that our history only exists as our recollection of it. And we keep telling the same story over and over and over again. Yet that's our story. And I know my brother and I grew up in the same household. We were four years apart. And his recollection of our childhood is quite different than my recollection. And I came to realize that that was my version of our childhood. He had his own version of it, and it's our truth. But how long are you going to keep telling a truth that doesn't serve you? And so you have the ability to go back and rewrite that history. Everyone's in charge of their own ending. And um, you no know, matter what life serves you, it's not what you get, it's what you do with it. And, and But to understand what your story is and to be conscious about that and then think, I now want to change that ending. I can see where this one's headed, but that's not the ending I want. Choose your own adventure. I want another one. I'm going to reinvent myself, so I'll leave these. The other thing I find um, is that giving creates energy around money. There's something funny about money, but the more you give, the more you get. And that is one of the laws of attraction. So even when I have been at my lowest points with money, I've never cancelled my subscriptions to sponsor children overseas, to have a couple of sponsor kids here, to give to Greenpeace, to give to 
animals and they're not massive amounts of money but they're constant reminders to me that world needs your financial energy and unless you are prepared to give it out don't expect to attract it back and that's a big yeah, you're giving out, around money. Yeah, exactly. You're giving out the vibration that you're confident that more is going to flow back to you so you have no problem giving it out. And, and usually when people are, for lack of a better term, stingy with money, <laughs> you know, not wanting to, to, to share it, 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 even for a cause they believe in, it's because there's a fear there that they're not going to have enough. And that's going mm -hmm. to manifest the scenario of not having enough every single time. I, I see it all the time. It's amazing. Mm, exactly, because it gives you that sense of lack that I better just hold on to what I've got and be happy with what I've got. Um, but I also think we have a responsibility to contribute financially to something or someone else outside of ourselves, um, I guess, as human beings. It, it's part of that law of nature of give to get and, and don't be a taker all the time and, and be open to receiving as well. And sometimes just being open to receiving, and that's quite feminine energy, you know, open to receiving, is is to allow people to give to you too. And a lot of the time we don't expect that. So an openness of heart and an energy around being able to receive as well as give is really important. And these are concepts people don't walk around thinking about when they're thinking I have to pay the electricity bill and how do I pay the rent and... You know, I wanted to go on a holiday and now there's no money left. Um, to be open to receiving and to keep giving no matter what are really important things to do. And the other one is being intentional. You have to write it down. You have to write down what you want and you have to put it somewhere where you look at it constantly because it's easy to be distracted in life. It just is. Right. Like there's just so much going on. We're all so busy that unless you have it written somewhere where you can constantly refer to what's your highest vision of what you want for money and yourself, then you'll forget about it. It'll just become something that you come to and go away from and it needs consistent energy put towards it to move towards it. Well, we have to change our subconscious thinking. It's, it's If we don't tend to our conscious thinking, it's never going to reprogram our subconscious thinking and that's what falls back into all of those those unwanted behaviors, those unwanted ideas, like you said, that are rooted in early childhood. Mm. All I think that stuff that we learn to do for people. You know, I know Marie Kondo has been a big thing of organize your life. You know, the money side of Marie Kondo is what do you have in your house that you could sell? And there's just little things that people can do now at whatever level they're at to think, how can I bring additional income into my home? and look around you, what have you already got that you've spent money? I, I love this quote, all of these, all of this clutter used to be money. And there's so many things <laughs> we have <That's> true. <laughs> <laughs> that we no longer service that it's like, could you spend time putting things online and selling them, even if it's for not much money? But you know, it's a way of creating an income stream that you didn't have before. And once you start to get the buzz around, hey, oh, I didn't have that $50 before I, you know, what else could I do? Suddenly things start to appear before your eyes, opportunities. Oh, I could do this. I could do that. You know, I could drive an Uber. I could, you know, there's so many things we call it the side hustle that you could do to, to bring additional income in that you start to get a buzz around. Actually, you know what? It's just not, I don't have enough and this is my job and that's what I'm stuck with. What are the other ways I can be entrepreneurial around bringing whatever level, just some level of other income into my life. And that again is about being open to ideas and pursuing them and making the effort. And you can't just sit there and think it's gonna happen for you. If you meditate on, I want this to happen and do nothing, action causes energy, causes outcome. And you need to be doing an action every day that gets you in a better money position. You need to be educating yourself for seven minutes every day about understanding money. And putting the energy in will get you the outcome. Yeah, it's funny, in the Law of Attraction teachings, of course, there are some popular teachers out there. And one, of course, is the book, The Secret, which you know is one of the best selling books of all time. So people have read it. It did a lot for humanity in, in teaching people that they create their own reality. But it did sort of yeah, give the impression that trying you... to do that with the car park, you know, I'm like, well, the secret, I got that good. Uh, car. Yeah, like... <laughs> well, yeah, that, that one works really, really well. But I think it yeah. also a lot of people sort of misunderstood because the book was so surface level, if you will, it didn't go too deep into it, but it, 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 it gave a great message. But I think a lot of people, there was one scene in the movie where you're sitting there and somebody was thinking of a red bike and the red bike just materialized out front. And I think sometimes people took that too literally. 
and believe that they could just sit on their sofa, do nothing, and then manifest. And I hear people uh, at the the Abraham shows all the time because Abraham's a big law of attraction teacher. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, saying how can I do nothing? And, and earn money. And, and there's an answer to that. But my answer to that is always, well, what, what are you going to do then? If you're doing nothing, what's your purpose in life? You know, why can't you tie something that you really enjoy doing to something that's going to produce some some dollars for you? I don't, I don't understand the whole idea of I want to sit and do nothing and just have this money appear. Even if you're an investor, you need to pay attention to your investments or they can go the wrong direction really fast. So that takes some inspired action on your part. And, and for me, I like to invest in things that I understand. Like I really understand real estate. And I used to flip houses. I'm thinking about getting back into that again because it's a hands-on thing that I can create. And I know I can create value and increase the value of that home with my action. And I love doing it. So to me, that's higher vibration than just, just handing money over to a stockbroker and say, here, you know, buy at this and sell at that. I understand the value in that. But... I like being involved. I like creating. I like doing. And I think a lot of times people just think that they there's nothing out there for them to do. So they have to go to some job that they hate and they want to learn how to just manifest money from their mindset without doing anything. And I don't think that's necessarily the way to do it. Agreed. You have to take action. And that's why... You know, I've lived in an interesting world that's somewhere between the hardcore finance industry and the real world where people need to understand that a lot of the time emotions, feelings, upbringing, other things that are really holding them back with money. And um, you do, you have to do both. You have to work on the mindset of yourself. And it's not horrible when you say, oh, God, it's another thing for me to do because nobody wants more stuff piled on their back. But I actually really enjoy it. Like, I enjoy the time to myself in the morning, even if it's only 20 minutes before I've got one of my sons screaming at me for food. Um, you know, it, it, it's just that 20 minutes to, to get my mindset right. And I do enjoy reading articles, and it's so easy on your phone that I hadn't thought of before other people's views on money. And I think, oh, that's interesting. You store that away and move on. And I've enjoyed buying shares on an app. You can get apps now where you buy shares yourself and you can buy things like Apple. I mean, a very, very good investor here in Australia taught me once to teach your kids how to invest. What are the products they love? Are they gamers? Are they Do they love Nike shoes? Whatever product they love, get them to buy a few shares, even if it's, you know, they spend a couple of hundred bucks on an app to do it to understand, you know, if they're liking it, there must be other kids there liking it and what that does to its value. And that's a really cool thing to do as well. My son's just put $500, his birthday money, in some shares. And, of course, then the pandemic happened. He's lost 200 of it already and he's devastated. But it's a, it's a fabulous um, lesson for him to understand that markets move and the last thing he should be doing is taking his money out now. It's a high-quality company. He did the research. And it will recover. But, you know, he would never learn those money lessons in adulthood if he hadn't learned it at the age of 17 by investing what to him is a lot of money, $500, because that's all the money he had. Well, it's good that you're teaching him about loss also, because there's a difference. I don't like to gamble. I like to invest, but I don't like to gamble. Because to me, gambling, you are rolling the dice literally and, and, and potentially just throwing your money away. And it, it is sort of luck. I like the st- strategy behind investing. And of course, kids are really into pop culture. They know what's going on more than we do. I didn't know what TikTok Way was more. until a couple of months ago, right? Mm-hmm. And now it's, it's huge. Yeah, I still don't know it's how it works, huge. but yeah, it's huge. Yes. Yeah, yes. it's just another thing to, to numb your brain <laughs> while you're sitting at home. We got quarantined, I think. But, you know, it's entertaining and there's no ads on there yet. And, you know, the the things that are really popular right now have to do with being stuck at home. That uh, Netflix, of course, is more popular than ever. Zoom video is probably the biggest winner in this so far. So knowing that stuff and knowing what to invest in, I wish I had invested in Zoom. I use Zoom every day of my life and my business. Mm. So we're yeah, coming up at the end good... of the hour. So go ahead. No, no. It's a, whatever you like is a good thing to look at investing in because you can bet that others like it, too. Right. And you're going to, to have know what's coming next and you're going to get into that, that space and know what's coming next. And that's a really good thing to do as an investor. So we're coming up on the end of the hour. Before we leave, I want you to tell them where to find you and where to find your book and uh, everything else. Well, you can buy my book on Amazon in America. It's called The Breakfast Club for 40 somethings. So um, that's available on Amazon or Audible if you like audio books. My website is Vanessa Stoikov, Stoikov spelled S-T-O-Y-K-O-V. My father was Serbian. 
an immigrant here to Australia. So if you go to Vanessa Stoikov, you can sign up for my free newsletter and um, I send money tips and I write money stories and you go, hey, that character's like me. And there's also a resource section on there. So learning if you wanted a financial advisor, what to ask them, what's a good one, you know, a reinvention journal, how do I write down what I really want in my life so I can manifest it. So there's a whole bunch of free resources there that I've got for people. Fantastic. So be sure to check out Vanessa, everybody. And I want to thank you all so much for listening. And Vanessa, it's been a lot of fun having you on. And I want to go invest in something new now. Excellent. <laughs> I look forward to hearing what that is. Good luck, Dave. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone. Namaste. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.